Okay, so thank you very much. I hope everybody can hear me. <clears throat> and um, so this last two hours, more or less, I'm gonna um, sort of complete, um, complete, uh, let's complete the overview, let's say, <laughs> on the structure of uh, PDE constraint measures. And um, so the first lecture was more about motivation somehow. So this second one will be about the theorem so that we can actually prove and uh, some of um, a sketch of the proof. Say. Okay, so um, so the, the, the topic would be to understand the structure of PDE constraint measure. So remember, so mu is a say radon value measure is a vector value with radon measure. V is a finite dimensional subspace, say so it's finite dimensional vector space. Which will soon be identified with some R N. Might be nice to not think it as R N sometimes. Uh, A is the differential operator. which I'm gonna take uh, homogeneous of degree K. Okay, so I was saying that A is a differential operator homogeneous of degree K. So, which means that it has just the uh, Kth order derivatives. So it's something which I would write this way. So here A alpha are linear operators from say V into W and the alpha is just the usual multi-index notation for the derivatives and the alpha is the length of the multi-index. And, uh, and I'm interested in basically in measures which are satisfying A of mu equals zero. Okay, so these are called A free measures. That is not the best name. And uh, <clears throat> And note that this is indeed the system of equation, okay? And the question is now what we can say about the singular part of mu. Well, okay, the, the, the actual question would be what you can say about mu, but let's start from the singular part too. And uh, maybe it's interesting to take uh, two extreme cases to start seeing what's going on. So the first case is the situation in which A is identically, the identically zero operator, right? So it's not very, it be a bit boring case, but the point here is that any mu is a free, So nothing can be saved. The second case is when A is like the Laplace, okay, maybe component-wise. So Laplace of mu equals zero is an elliptic equation. which implies that while it's lemma actually, mu is indeed smooth. So in particular, there is no singular part. Okay, so in a sense, these are two extreme cases in one in which I cannot say anything and one in which I cannot, I, I would just say that there is no singular part. Uh, okay, Oops. Um, so 
it seems that somehow ellipticity uh, of the of the equation would play a role but the problem with system of equation is that ellipticity somehow can change depending on the direction in the target domain okay so let me give you uh, a more uh, detailed situation maybe so assume that mu is the form lambda times nu here lambda is fixed vector Fixed, no? and new <clears throat> is a say scalar measure okay. so this lambda is somehow is one dimensional or i would say more one directional so if you think lambda um, mu as a measure as a function so here mu is uh, so this is omega which is where my measure is defined and uh, here, if I have my vector space V, what I just take a direction inside this vector uh, space, which is the direction lambda, and basically mu as image only along this line, okay? So now, A of mu equals zero means the following, <clears throat> um, okay? Let me write this way first and then I comment. Means B lambda of nu equals zero, where B lambda of a, of a function phi is just A or lambda phi. Okay, and that's a stupid uh, way of rewriting. So, in a sense, you see that somehow the scalar part of oops, the scalar part of this measure here is satisfying an equation. And now we might argue whether this equation is somehow elliptic or not, and whether we can say something on this uh, scalar part of the measure. So the best way to do is to go via Fourier transform. So just assume that mu is not only a measure, but it's a temporary distribution on RD, just to make things simple. Temporary distribution. I mean, it's maybe. It's not important this way actually, but at least for this part, let me assume it. It's a temporary distribution. So that I can Fourier transform this equation to get the zero is equal to B lambda psi nu hat psi where B lambda psi is just the operator. I think this should be two pi i to the alpha. Uh, sum alpha equal k, a alpha, uh, what is my notation? A alpha lambda, so these are vectors, right? It's a vectors in V, in W, sorry. Uh, times psi to the alpha, where this is the classical polynomial, right? Psi to the alpha, psi alpha one, psi alpha d, and nu hat psi is nothing but the Fourier transform e to the pi i x dot psi d nu psi. Okay. The Fourier trans uh, sorry, d nu x. The Fourier transform of my measure x. Okay, so. <clears throat> So now we start from these things here and we verify. So these things is zero. So either there is xi for which this is zero or not, right? I mean, this is like, a, this is a vector. These are, this is a vector for each side, this is a vector in W, which can or cannot be zero, right? So assume that, B lambda uh, psi is different from zero for all psi different from zero. That's the only option, right? If psi is zero, if you look at here, if psi is zero, this thing is going to be zero. So this implies, so this implies that the support of this distribution is contained in the origin. Okay, so this is cannot be zero. 
uh, this has to be zero for all psi different from zero. So the only point where this distribution cannot be zero is the origin, right? But now distribution whose support uh, is contained in the origin can be explicitly written. And actually, I mean, since this is a measure, this force is new to be somehow a delta measures. So it's some constant times the delta measure. Uh, sorry, the new is a, um, it's a new, uh, no, sorry, let's say new is some polynomial times the back measure. Yeah, I don't know yet. It's, I mean, it's, it depends. If, if it's globally finite, uh, I mean, not glo globally finite, I mean, uh, should be zero, actually, but okay. Anyhow, th this is the structure that's the Schwarz lemma, right? So in particular, new is absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure, okay? So on the other hand, if B lambda psi is equal to zero for some psi, I can consider, I can take, say, uh, sigma to be a singular measure on R. And consider new uh, amount new, let, let me write as it were functions new x to be sigma of x dot psi, okay? So if this is a word function, I'm like taking new to be a one dimension, it also depends just on the direction parallel to, to psi. Then it's easy to see that uh, um, it's easy to see now that if you look to mu to be lambda sigma x dot psi, then a of mu is equal to zero, okay? So basically uh, these things will just leave. Um, yeah. Um, and in a sense, these things would be zero for all, uh, so the Fourier transform, so okay, maybe it's, it's confusing this way. So if, so let's call these things psi bar. So it's fixed vector, right? So the Fourier transform of this uh, sigma, so if I look to sigma act of psi, well, then these things uh, is zero. It's, so the support of these things just contain into psi bar. Contained into the span of the cyber. Okay. So, <clears throat> so the point is this. So, in a sense, what the, what we are saying is that if B land of psi bar is diff, uh, sorry, B land of psi. Well, let's put it like this. Um, all measures of the form than the new and let's make so for measures, let's put like this, for measure of the form lambda mu, uh, we have the following. So just for this type of measure, if the kernel, so, If lambda does not belong 
to the kernel of a psi where a psi is just the sum uh, of a alpha psi alpha which is a linear operator in p and w and remember that my b lambda psi is just a psi applied just computation this to lambda if lambda does not belong to this kernel then nu is absolutely continuous to the Lebesgue measure and vice versa if lambda belongs to the kernel there exists uh, a singular measure nu such that uh, Sorry, can I just quickly ask? So you mean that if lambda doesn't belong to this kernel for any, any xi or for every xi? Yeah, for any xi. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, if lambda does not for all xi. Yeah. Sorry. Thanks. You. Let me write correctly. Yes. If lambda does not belong to the kernel for all xi, then. Um, sorry. Then new is. Okay, the new is absolutely continuous with the Lebesgue measure, vice versa, if there exists psi bar such that lambda belongs to the kernel of a uh, psi bar different from zero, so psi, yeah, yeah, zero is always, um, such that lambda belongs to this kernel, then there exists a singular measure mu such that a of mu is equal to zero. Okay, so it seems that But there is, since this is better, this is a singular measure nu such that mu equal lambda nu is singular. But it's singular, it's for sure, but and a of mu is equal to zero. Okay, so basically, what seems to discriminate is the possibility of having or not vectors in this term. Okay, so let us define the following thing. So given a differential operator, we're going to define what is called the wave cone, which is the union over xi different from zero, xi equal one is the same thing because of homogeneity of the kernel of eight sides. Okay, so this is a subset of W, uh, sorry, of V. And this is a cone. And this is the wave cone associated to the operator. So, uh, so there are a few different characterizations. So for instance, so in a sense, this cone is, uh, is encoding the direction al along which our operator fails indeed to be uh, elliptic. So let me write this way. So a vector lambda does not belong to the wave cone, if and only if the operator B lambda of phi, which is say as A of lambda phi is elliptic, in the sense, so that's it's sort of triviality, that uh, the symbol B lambda xi is injective. So why well, is injective? It's different from zero. It's just a vector vector for all xi. Okay. So that's my my and not only my definition of ellipticity. So. Um, so you have an operator, um, so an operator, uh, so note that this is defined just on scalar valued function and this uh, is elliptic if its symbol doesn't vanish. But now you see that when you instead look to a system, well, then depending of, on the direction in which your, uh, your solution lies, well, the, 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 the operator can be elliptic on certain direction or non-elliptic on certain other directions. So for those with know a bit of micro local analysis, they might think this to be related to the wave front sets of, uh, of an operator, which was introduced by your mander, but that's not really the same thing. Main reason being that the wave cone lives in the, in the image somehow, while the wave front set lives in the, uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the domain. So this is more related to what is called the polarization sets. 
which was introduced didn't have much of a success, but uh, was also introduced in the in the in the um, uh, micro local community. And uh, so there has been a sort of a recent paper on this point of view. So which is somehow phrasing our theorem in this in this setting of uh, Bani and Burke, which is like last year. And uh, so the other thing I maybe want to mention before I forget is that. So this wavecon was introduced by Murat and Tartar in their study of compensated compactness, and uh, it again plays a role, uh, an important role in that setting. Because as I'm saying here, okay, I'm going to apply this to, to somehow some concentration phenomena, but they, they were more interested in oscillation phenomena. But the the key point here is that these are these things is somehow uh, encoding the easiest failure of uh, ellipticity for a system. Okay. So th this is already telling you in which direction your system can fail to be elliptic. It can fail to be elliptic also for other reasons. So it's not so easy life in the sense, okay, if the wave gone is not there, then life is nice. That's not so true, unfortunately, but uh, somehow the, sometimes yes. So that, that's somehow the, the first thing you might hope to check what, what is happening at the level of the wave cones and then uh, if things work already in that direction, in that situation, you're lucky. Otherwise, you need to, to understand more. OK. So all of this to say that uh, um, it seems that this wave con is, uh, is going to play a role. And, uh, um, and actually, this is indeed the case. So theorem, which is the one we proved with Philip, is the following. So let me be um, a radon measure. Let's say an AE free radon measure. So it's solving the equation. Then at mu singular almost all points. If you look to the infinitesimal direction as you say to this measure, so the polar vector, it belongs to the wave cone of the operator. Okay. So in a sense, the only possibility for you to have a singular part is that uh, indeed along that singular part, the um, the um, the singular, uh, I mean, point of the singular part, somehow the infinitesimal direction of your measure should align in the direction of the wave cone. So let me give you a couple of corollary of this, just to, before going into the proof. Uh, the first one is Alberti and Quant theorem. So, which goes less. So take A to be the car row wise. So it goes as follows. So you take, um, okay. So, so, so now if I, if I want to compute what is the wave con associated to A, so the wave con associated to the curl, well, it's not hard to see that this is given by the matrix is of the form A of Psi, uh, such that A is uh, in RL and Psi is in RD. So this is the set of rank one matrices. It's just a, an algebraic computation. So the good thing about the wavecon is that you can algebraic compute it. Okay. I mean it's mass. You need to write the symbol of the operator to compute the kernel, take union, but anyhow, it is what it is. You're gonna get a wavecon. Okay, it might take an afternoon, but so. So the, in particular, this tells that if u is a BV function, then the infinitesimal uh, direction of its uh, of its gradient is of rank one at u s almost all points. Or oh, a second corollary is what happens, and I'm just this on this, I'm gonna just be quick. What happens when A is the Carl Carl, which is characterized symmetrized gradients? So this characterized symmetrized gradient. So 
And uh, in that case, one can compute, again, might take something, that the wave cone is given by symmetrized tensor products, so things of the form Two, so we get the generalization of uh, Albertian and Quant theorem to the setting of BD theorem of function of bounded variation. So in this case, you can prove that the symmetrized gradient, which is usually denoted by EU, so EU is just the gradient of U plus the gradient transpose of U. Or two. Um, this is uh, this is of the form A dot. B for EU singular or most or less. Okay. So, um, so these are two correlates. This was actually our the main motivation for us to, to start looking at this problem. Um, there is a third corollary, which is what maybe is more interesting in this audience, which is con uh, con uh, related to Rademacher theorem. So, take uh, uh, the divergence operator on uh, um, on d by t on uh, d by d matrices then the wave cone associated to the divergence operator is just given by those matrix such that m of xi is equal for, to zero for some xi Actually, when I read this way, it's just a bit cheating because uh, no, it's not a bit cheating. It's um, it's an indication how to compute. So basically, this is indeed the kernel of the symbol H psi. So if I fix psi in the kernel of H psi, I have matrices which has psi into the kernel, and uh, uh, and then if I take the union on on all of psi, then I get the wave cone. Okay, so same in all my way of writing. So when there is psi in there, it's just a suggestion that this is. The, the, the kernel of the operator with fit psi, um, which is just uh, the matrices of rank. So note that in dimension two, uh, as it should, these are basically the same, and that's because the divergence of the curl in dimension two are basically the same thing, after a rotation. Um, Okay, so these are these matrices, but then this tells you that if so corollary of corollary of the corollary, so let's call it corollary square. Um, is that if mu one, mu d are um, R D valued radon measure, then it's mu1 plus mu d almost all point. If I look to the random uh, singular, sorry, uh, almost all singular points. If I look to the random measure, which is given by the matrix, well, this has to be in which I put these things like, a, um, okay, so if this one, sorry. I still miss one coffee this morning, sorry. If this is uh, uh, like this with divergence of mu i equal to zero, well then if I look to this uh, the, at almost all these points, then uh, uh, X, if I look to the rank, uh, let's say to the span, of their vectors, <sighs> this is a proper subset of our thing, right? Because it'll be the, the, so the matrix, which has these things as a row, will have a rank, which is not the is at most d minus one, so this is a proper subspace. But now, if you look to this, is that uh, um, if you if you remember what we were discussing about the converse of Rademacher theorem using the um, 
the um, Alberti Marchese uh, situation. So imagine that sigma is a, is a measure for which you have the for which the Rademacher theorem holds. Well, then the dimension of the vector space of the, its uh, the composability bundle should be d, which means that you can find d vector d the radon, radon valued measures which has divergence free for which sigma is absolutely continuous with respect to each of them and uh, for which uh, the span of these things is at least d right so now if you combine this with my previous corollary the fact that this span is d well then would mean that uh, these measures are all absolutely continuous with respect to their back measure right because if they have a singular part there would be a singular part for the sum and then, uh, and then in that point, this span cannot be the wall RD, cannot have dimension D. So if this span is dimension D, it means that all measures are absolutely continuous with respect to their back measure, which means that sigma as well is to be absolutely continuous with respect to the measure. Okay. So a corollary of this last fact is the converse of Rademacher theorem, right? Because so it would be like a corollary cube. It means that if mu satisfies Rademacher theorem, then mu should be absolutely continuous with respect to the measure. And actually, sort of, you can get from here the full statement. So remember that I was saying something better. I was saying that if that, um, where was it? Maybe here, yes. So basically what we were saying is that if the dimension of the decomposability bundle is L, then sigma should be absolutely continuous with respect to HL. So the L dimensional Hausdorff measure. So how do I recover this from the previous theorem? Well, not immediately, but say that the intuition is the following. So basically imagine that, so this decomposability bundle is like, uh, is like a bundle. So by sort of, uh, Stupid measure theoretic arguments, you can sort of assume that it's constant. Okay, it varies very little. You just uh, localize yourself in a situation in which this guy is not changing too much. Well, then you project your measure on one of these bundles. Okay, so like say that in one point, you know, it's some RL, you project uh, nearby points on that. Well, then you get a measure which is sort of solving, uh, which is satisfying Rademacher into this RL. Okay. Because uh, I mean, in a sense, that the bundle of the projection me projected measure should be the projected bundle. So since the bundle all over there is not was not changing much, then when you project it on RL, it's still full RL. Okay. Well, but now you can apply the theorem to this projected measure and say, okay, that this measure has to be absolutely continuous with respect to the back L-dimensional measure on these things, and this basically holds true for almost all uh, all direction you are projecting. So you get that uh, you get that this is absolutely continuous with respect to the HL measure, and indeed I was saying you are actually absolutely continuous with respect to the integral geometric measure, which is just looking what is happening on projections. And it's like the integral geometric measure. I don't want to, to make a definition now, but it's basically you take your measure, you project your, your set or whatever you project onto some on, on a vector space, uh, L-dimensional vector space. You compute the Lebesgue measure in there. And then you sum up on all possible vector spaces. Okay, that I mean at least this is not um, the measure, but it's um, how you get null sets. Okay, and we are all in, in null sets. Um, okay, so this theorem is a consequence of that one plus some sort of measure theory, sort of known measure theory. Okay, um, so this is all the corollaries. So. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, maybe it's a good moment to stop, and I'm gonna sketch the proof uh, um, of the theorem, like in uh, in the next uh, in the last uh, forty five minutes. I think there is is supposed to be a coffee break now, right? Or in five minutes? Yes, there could be a coffee break of half an hour. So um... yeah, yeah, maybe yeah, maybe it's a it's a good moment to stop, see if there are questions, and, uh, and then I, I'll take the last 45 minutes for, for the proof.